Hey everyone, I know it's been a while. Um, my projects are kind of on hold right now as I'm actually uh, moving, so all of my stuff is packed up for the next couple of months. Um, but I kind of wanted to nerd out with everyone. Um, if you know anything about me, I'm really into the uh, Formula One gearboxes and gearboxes in general. And up until recently, there's been no information available about the hybrid era gearboxes. But during qualifying at the uh, Emilia Romagna GP, uh, Yuki Tsunoda crashed and actually broke his gearbox in half on his Alphatari. And Nicholas F1 managed to snap three pictures of the actual insides of the gearbox hanging out, um, showed a lot of detail about uh, how these gearboxes are constructed if you actually know what you're looking for. So I wanted to kind of go through that and analyze some of what I've learned and kind of get your feedback and uh, thoughts and theories on these uh, gearboxes as well. So I'm gonna go through the photos uh, one by one. Um, first up, which is uh, really interesting to me, is that uh, the gearbox does have a very large main shaft. So actually I'll go ahead and label this. So this is gonna be your main shaft and this shaft down here, be your lay shaft. Um, the reason I can tell that is because I can actually see uh, the hub collar here. So what this means is this large diameter of main shaft is that there is some sort of clutching mechanism inside the main shaft itself, which is extremely important. Um, everything I've heard about the current era of hybrid uh, F1 gearboxes is that they can actually select two gears at once. And I've seen numerous patents uh, from x and some of the other uh, producers of these motorsports gearboxes that show some of these different types of clutching mechanisms. Uh, so when you're shifting, essentially what will happen is if this is first gear, which it actually appears it might be, well, this would actually be third gear, but we'll pretend it's second gear. Um, what would happen is you could actually select both first and second at the same time and what would happen is essentially the one-way clutch on first gear would disengage and the second gear clutch would engage so that there's no lapse except for maybe a tenth of a you know turn in the uh, gear itself. So there's absolutely uh, no torque drop because in a typical gearbox, what you're going to have is essentially your torque line is going to be like this, shift, 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 and then go out like that. Um, but in a seamless gearbox, you're going to basically have this. You might have a little like that between shifts. You might be able to save a few milliseconds per shift um, going from the previous generation to the, new, the latest generation of the hybrid era seamless gearboxes, which you know on some tracks that have say almost 100 shifts, um, that's a significant amount of lap time that you're saving. So, And what's interesting is I'll go into this later, it does appear this generation of gearboxes actually does have uh, sliders or dog clutches uh, which is something that I'm a little surprised to see. So we'll go ahead and go to the next picture here. Okay, so this is probably the most uh, significant picture of all the three pictures um, from being able to show the actual details of the gearbox. So um, this uh, little piece here is going to feed oil down the main shaft itself. And there are oil uh, holes in the main shaft that feed all of the roller bearings. Um, this first gear that you actually see here on the hub is going to be your reverse gear. Um, so as you can see, the teeth are kind of angled and that actually allows a almost like a Bendix type drive uh, to engage the reverse gear. So the reverse gear will most likely be over here or on this side here that got uh, uh, broken off and that'll actually slide into place and engage uh, those tapered gears. Again, reverse is primarily there for the regulation. And I've read something like uh, the reverse gear is only good for a few hundred feet of uh, travel distance. So these uh, little squares you see here on the uh, reverse gear itself, those are going to be for some sort of uh, magnetic uh, sensor that's going to actually sense the position of the gears. Um, so that it, the uh, gearbox can sense RPM as well as, you know, from what I'm understanding about the current generation, even the previous generation, was that the gearbox uh, could actually shift uh, so fast and so perfectly that it actually could shift in the gaps uh, between the uh, dog teeth themselves. The other things that are interesting in this picture, um, we've got this oil tube again that's going to feed oil or it's got some sort of other structure. 
So again, I can see just here, I'm, I'm thinking this little point here, and you can kind of see it running along the backside of the gear is going to be the actual uh, slider or the dog clutch itself. Um, so again, that lends well to the theory that there's a dog clutch in here. So again, you can see quite a bit of interesting um, stuff right here as well. So again, this is going to be your lay shaft. Um, this up here will be your main. Uh, but what's really interesting you can see here is very clearly that there is some sort of slider or dog clutch. Now, what's interesting about this to me is that in 2009, Honda actually had a gearbox that they had designed uh, during the V8 era that was essentially a seamless gearbox like this that actually had a, uh, a clutch or a strut mechanism that allowed for gear selection, but it was entirely, the entire uh, gear selection was incorporated inside of the main shaft itself. Um, so there were no sliders, there were no shift barrels. It really eliminated a lot of uh, components from the gearbox. And the other cool part about that uh, design that Honda came up with was that uh, these gears, um, as you can see, there's actually a space between the two gears uh, to allow that uh, slider. Um, that space wouldn't need to be there. Um, so the gearbox could be much shorter, like 110 millimeters is what I was figuring from the pictures that I was looking at. So you're cutting off uh, 60, 70, 80 millimeters of gearbox, which would be significant. So I am curious as to why they went with uh, this particular design. Uh, my theory is that there's a couple of things. Um, the hybrid era, the regulations around the number of gearboxes are much more stringent. So I'm curious to if that type of design of gearbox just didn't work out from a durability standpoint, as well as now we have a much uh, larger, um, you know, curves and uh, turbos uh, feeding all a lot more torque through this gearbox. I mean, the V8 era gearbox had uh, very low torque. I think somewhere actually under 300 pound feet of torque uh, coming out of that entire engine, um, even though it was making, you know, 700, 800 horsepower. That made it a lot easier on the gearbox for sure. Um, this hybrid era, I believe that they're well over uh, five, 600 uh, pound feet of torque. So the, the shift fork is this actual piece here. Um, and it's going to actually extend. And I believe it goes up to this piece here. So you would actually go out here and it would come down something like that. Forgive my terrible drawing here. Um, but this would slide actually uh, along a tube, this tube here, and actually engage the two different gears. Um, I am curious to know whether or not on the opposite side of all of this, if there's an actual um, shift drum itself. So the shift drum, and I'll, I'll show a picture here in the video of what a shift drum is, is actually just a drum that rotates and actually moves a pin that actually moves these uh, shift uh, forks actually. I'm curious, uh, one, whether or not this actually has uh, a single shift drum, which most likely it would have, because there's no need for two shift drums in this particular case. So I'm kind of curious when I did the math and there's, so there's eight gears and I actually went through and did a little uh, state diagram uh, for each gear as to how many states it would have to have with that one way clutch in there. Um, because there essentially has to be, every gear has to be selected um, three times. So you shift into, say, second gear um, while first gear is engaged. Then you shift into second gear just by itself. And then you shift into second gear with third gear engaged. So there's three states, but they do overlap with the previous gear. So what comes out to is basically, um, from what I can tell, it's going to be 14 actual states that this gearbox has to go through for the shift forks themselves. So 14 states on a single shift drum is a very uh, large shift drum in uh, diameter, or it's um, very uh, steep ramp angles on the shift drum. And that kind of leads me to believe that there is either, you know, one, a very large shift drum, so you've got one, the uh, large shift drum theory. And I'm curious for everyone's feedback on this. Uh, you can also have 
two shift drums. So I've seen some pictures of the previous generation of Toyota seamless F1 gearbox, and they actually did some cool things um, with having some smaller shift drums. And so each of these shift drums, when you have two of them, I think it comes out to nine states you have to have per shift drum. Um, they actually integrated the shift drum itself into the shift fork tube. So it was actually inside of the shift fork tube and they could actually, you know, they had a little slot that the pin uh, would slide up and down on the shift fork tube. Uh, so it could be a very compact design with two shift fork tubes, essentially uh, side by side. Um, alternatively, you could have two shift drums external to these uh, tubes, uh, but you, again, you're starting to get into a pretty large gearbox, which was part of the issue with the, uh, like the previous generation X-Track gearbox that I, uh, my first F1 gearbox model uh, was of. Uh, it just was not ideal from a packaging standpoint. So the last one is that they actually have hydraulic actuators on each fork. So that means that each of these shift forks um, up here are independently controlled uh, by a hydraulic. Um, and this is actually very similar to what you would see in the uh, Porsche PDK gearbox. Um, there's actually a little hydraulic cylinder uh, for each shift fork. And they actually end up having, um, in their particular case, in Porsche's case, they have a individual uh, tube for each one of the shift forks. Um, but there, there's different me means that we could uh, theorize that you could uh, have a lower number of those tubes. So again, I'm super curious what everyone thinks about this because this is kind of the, the real key to how this whole gearbox works. I think I have enough information about the main shaft itself to be able to design a model of it or some, you know, picking one of the mechanisms that I know is out there. You know, I'd love to know kind of what everyone's theory is on how this actually works. Because again, I want to build a working model of this and I'm really close, you know, to being able to kind of pull together all the notes and paperwork for being able to do one. Uh, but there's, like I said, there's some big outstanding theories. You know, I'm just so excited that, uh, you know, we're able to see this much of the gearbox. I mean, that, that tells you that, you know, it's been, gosh, seven years of the hybrid era. And over seven years, this is the first time that uh, there's any photos available of anything inside these gearboxes. So it's pretty cool to see. And uh, I think it's going to make a really cool model. So again, uh, hopefully in the next month or two, I'll be able to be set up again in my new place and kind of resume my uh, old projects. But, uh, you know, I think I've got a lot of other cool projects that I'm going to have kicking off here soon too. So thanks everyone and uh, stay safe out there.